So we've got our prayer. Did you get a prayer? Yeah, I'll take it. Okay. Okay. So let's say our prayer together. Glory be to the Father, and by his almighty power and love, created in his image and likeness. Glory be to the Son, who in his incarnation became, amen, so I could become God. Glory be to the Holy Spirit, who did it in his eyes, in the Son. It makes me a part of his divine nature. nature. Glory be to Glory the Holy Trinity and undivided Trinity. 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 Now and forever. Amen. Amen. Well, Adorable. thank you for praying that with me. I think we're going to mute everyone now, but unmute yourself if you'd like to get us started today. I, my friend Shannon is with us here in the room today, and she might have a question she wants to ask, perhaps. But um, anyway, it's open for anybody who wants to start sharing anything that is uh, powerful to them and would like to maybe talk more about it or ask something that they've been wondering about or any other point of entry into the mystery. So everyone's muted now, but you can unmute yourselves at will. Okay, so Shannon's here. She's got her mask on. I don't think anybody on the Zoom will give her COVID, but anyway, she's we're respecting her wishes. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I emailed you a couple weeks ago about confirmation. This is something, even as a Catholic, people are always questioning. Confirmation, why do you guys do that? That's not something in the Bible. And so I would love to hear more about that. I didn't think you were going to ask that, but oh, you didn't? anyway. Well, I got more. <laughs> <laughs> well, you sent me that diagram you had done before, oh, and you, you uh, yes, wondered can I bring that? what the meaning of that was. I'm not sure. I have to take care of something that's going to be taken care of in January. Right. So we have to we'll have to watch the recordings to know where we, we should morning. pick up um, the phrase of the information kind of come from Pentecost too. Also to the uh, existence. So we've um, got oh, complaining. But I was thinking of the Eucharist, how God gives us uh, that might be a how God gave them food and God gives us food <clears> through <throat> the Eucharist um, and he uh, even so we <laughs> so the complaining hasn't stopped in the no, desert, no, huh? No. <laughs> People are still complaining. Oh, Father, my other one was okay. about the nuptial mystery. Here, now maybe this will get us a little closer to something <laughs> that's worth talking about. <laughs> it's just quick, the nuptial mystery. Well, what's your question? I can't even remember how I worded it, but this was something that you had said one of the first times that I met you, and I was just in awe. Um, and you talked for hours about it and nobody understood, I don't think what you were saying, but we knew it was deep and we needed to hear it. And so we were just all like, what is he talking about? We know we need this. Um, but you were talking about just being the bride and uh, the nuptial mystery. I, I took notes and I can't remember what all I wrote, but it was, it was actual words that you had said, but then I had nothing behind it. It was so powerful. I couldn't come up with anything else, right? Do you remember that? And whenever Shannon's lost for words, you know, something different has been said. So uh, I do remember. Yeah, okay. I, th I thought it was at the Curcio. Perhaps. It was at the yeah. Curcio. So. You said it also on our weekend by the lake. <laughs> I tend to say it everywhere I go. So I'll, I'll start it again because we've, we've talked about it here too, but uh, maybe we can fold... Um, so we have a number of comments on the floor right now. One is, what about confirmation? It's not in the Bible. Um, actually, it is. Um, we have another one about the, the jo Jews uh, graping to Moses in the desert. Why'd you bring us out here to leave us die? How come God won't give us any food? Then when he does give them food, he says they say we're sick and tired of this bread. How, well, about, how about some meat? So that's still coming. <laughs> I think the word they use, what's the word they use manna, about, uh, manna, well, yeah, manna. about not about manna, but about the griping. They uh, they complained to Moses, mur murmuring. They were murmuring against Moses, mur murmuring, yeah. Murmuring is the, is the um, 
it's the inverse of joy. Murmuring is, uh, you know, we talk about people bubbling with joy and we talk about people boiling over with anger. So there's bubbles in both cases, but uh, one's of hell and one's of heaven, right? So the, the children of Israel grumbled. They grumbled, they murmured, and they, they complained. So we have the complaining of the Israelites, which is not unique to the Israelites. We have confirmation, we have the nuptial mystery, then we have Jesus feeds us with the Eucharist, and then Jesse, you made a comment about Pentecost. Pentecost. Does, isn't um, isn't, um, isn't uh, confirmation related to Pentecost? Um, well, there's, there's one other, and it was from last week's comment at the very end. I don't recall who it was, the gentleman that commented about um, something to do with our memories and history. And we thought that might be a good leaping off for this week. Yeah, I think Earl asked that question. What's the relationship of memory to, I don't know if it was remaining in the present moment or um, I can't remember what we were asking, what's the value of memory for? Uh, we can't remember. That's we we, we can't we can't remember. Tie all this together. So we're gonna tie all that together, right? Good luck. Yeah, it's easy to do actually. Um, so um, there there really is only one. I, I've heard the mysteries of the Christian faith. Um, compared to, you know, the seven sacraments, for example, and all the passages in scripture, I've heard it compared sometimes to the spokes in a wheel. So they all come out from a common hub. And what is the hub? What is the hub? Now, sacra in sacramental theology, we tend to say that the central sacrament is Eucharist that the Eucharist makes the church, that there is no church without the Eucharist. And that's, that's, that's fundamentally true. There were two commandments that Jesus gave to the apostles, go and baptize all people in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and do this as the memorial of me. So there were two, there were two loci, to use a geometric term, to loci where those who assembled in the name of the Lord, recalling his words, wherever two or three gather in my name, I will be with you. They put all these things together as they were doing them. They kind of discovered it and made it up as they went along. All they had were the great commandments, go and baptize and go and celebrate Eucharist and make disciples of all people. So the church is essentially a gathering of people around baptism and the Eucharist. They, and, and in the early church, they called those the sacred mysteries, the heavenly mysteries. That's why I always, when I'm saying the prayers for mass or when the word sacrament appears, I usually change it to divine mysteries because it connotes more more eloquently, more mystically, what's actually involved in what we call the sacraments. We have, in my view, we have, we have pedestrianized and banalized and commercialized and transactionalized the sacraments. We've made them transactions between people and God. I've got, I got my confirmation. Uh, I've got my, I've got my baptism. I got my certificates. In fact, I can prove to you that I've been baptized and I got confirmation. And most people think that's what makes a good Catholic having your name recorded and that you've received the sacraments of sometimes we talk cynically about the hatch match and dispatch Catholics. I'm, I'm baptized. I'm married in the church and I'm buried in the church. And those, <laughs> those are the three, three times I show my face in the church. So so the church is not the institution that dispenses sacraments. The church is the sacrament of Christ's presence in the world. So a sacrament is an outward manifestation of, of, a, of a reality that is greater than the outward manifestation. 
And sacraments have become so overly ritualized that, um, that we've lost the ability to see that almost every action we perform as spiritual beings having a human experience. You know, Teilhard de Chardin said, humanity is not, people are not human beings having a spiritual experience. They're spiritual beings having a human experience. <laughs> And in a certain sense, that's what this gathering is all, all about, trying to reverse our perspective on who we are and who God is. But we have made God so completely into our own image and likeness. In other words, he's just a larger version of our, of our either our most benevolent or our most feared authority figure in our lives. So he becomes my father writ large. So... If my father got mad at me or my mother got mad at me for doing bad things, I assume that's how God is. He's just a larger parent in the sky somewhere. So, and sadly, for even for the Christians that remain in the world, to a large extent, that's their image of God. So none of this is relevant. I mean, it's all relevant, but none of it is of the true Christian mystery. So we start out by talking about this image of the wheel with the spokes and the hub. And what, what I've been saying here now in these first few remarks is that very often the seven sacraments are talked about as the, as the six spokes on the wheel connected to the hub, which is the Eucharist. But I would like to use that same image of the wheel and the hub, but multiply the number of spokes in the wheel to include everything that's in the world. Because you see, um, once you see that a sacrament, the, the word sacrament or the word, the word that we use for sacrament, an exterior vehicle for the communication of something that is largely interior or at least invisible, that which is communicating itself through the sacrament, through the, through the tangible objects. Sacraments are tangible objects, water, oil, bread, salt. Salt, do we use salt? No, we don't use salt. Oil, bread, water. Um, and then we have gestures, uh, you know, uh, sorry, laying on of hands, yes. And the sign of the cross and the sacrament of penance and the words, those are those are all outward expressions of something that is invisible. So when the priest says, I absolve you from all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, God is using those words, those exterior audible sounds, those material things, vibrations in the air. He's using those created objects to communicate a forgiveness and a love that is uncreated mm -hmm. and that transcends this world. Okay, so a sacrament, just generically speaking, not take it out of the realm of religion for a minute. Any, uh, any action can be called sacramental, which is an exterior expression of an invisible reality. Okay, so when I stand when I stand to sing the national anthem or pledge the allegiance to the flag, though some people have gone south on that now because they don't like the country. But if you did love the country and you did stand to sing the song, or I'll give you another example. You know, at football games, they have these flyovers with the Air Force jets. And those people who are patriotic feel something take place in them when those jets go over. I mean, if you look at it just from a materialistic standpoint, all it is is four pieces of metal passing through the air. But they are external emblems that connote something that is more mysterious, something that is invisible, intangible, but people are willing to lay down their lives to protect it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so those jets flying over are a sacramental gesture. Anything that we call a symbol. Okay, now the word symbolon in Greek means to throw together. Symbolon, like sin, the, the prefix sin or sim, S-Y-N, S-Y-M in Greek means to bring together. 
a symbolon. A symbolon was in the in the ancient world. A symbolon was two parts of an object that fit together. Boline in Greek means to throw, and sim means to bring together. So symbolon, symbol, symbol means to throw together, and and what they did in the ancient world was a symbol was a two-part object that I think it was actually a key that would unlock a door and but it came in two parts so they had to be joined together in order for it to work to open the door and so a symbol is a key that opens a door to an invisible reality so when I give you a hug or I give somebody I love a kiss the material vehicle of my mouth is conveying an in, in material, invisible wealth of love. So, so when you understand it in that sense, everything in the world is a sacrament of God's love. Everything in the world is a physical expression of an invisible reality. And here's a very mystical truth. It's the very variety of the objects in the physical world, even within general species and genuses. It's the very incomprehensible variety that is the sacramental expression of the kaleidoscopic dimensions of God's infinite love for the people he placed in this world. Okay, so everything from God's standpoint, everything is a sacrament of his love. It's an outward expression in a created material form of an invisible glory and an invisible love and an invisible fullness for which we have been created to become partakers. Yes. Okay, so the world exists as a sacrament of God's love to communicate to spiritual beings in human sacramental form the invisible mystery in whose image and likeness they have been created. Yes. <laughs> I'm looking at her at the end of the table. <laughs> So having said all of that, see, it's only in that context that you can even begin to understand why we have certain rituals within the Catholic Church, within the Christian Church. All Christian churches have symbols. All Christian churches have sacraments. Some only have two. They understand them differently. They would give a different interpretation to them than what we might give, give it in the Catholic Church. The Orthodox churches in the world and the Catholic Church are in communion because we give the same interpretation over time to the symbols of our religion. So the sac, the Eucharist is a symbol. It's an external ob object and ritual that God uses to communicate a specific kind of intimacy with himself to us. Okay, having said all of that, understand now that even the seven sacraments and all of the created objects in the world that we should now re begin to regard and begin to view as sacramental, meaning, again, physical objects that communicate the invisible presence and love of God to us in their multiple variety as different aspects of the love of God. All of it is created for all of it, all of all of it is created actually for the Son, Jesus. And we are created to share in the Son's sacramental love of the father that has that sounds a little dissonant let me try let me try to clarify that 
So I, I'm, I'm getting way, way ahead of myself here. So let's take a couple steps back, come back to the hub of the wheel, okay? If the Eucharist is the hub from which all the other sacraments uh, uh, extend, so let me let me um, let me let me explain that historically, very briefly. Okay. The 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 the, Euc the the church in the beginning there were no church buildings. There was just there were twelve apostles who knew him in the breaking of the bread. So let's go back to Luke twenty twenty two or twenty four. Okay. That's Father Mark. Kathy, do you want to go see if Father Mark cares to join us? We're not. Uh... Anyway, and I'll probably have to interrupt and introduce everybody to Father Mark here. So we'll see. I think he forgot that I invited him to, to Monday. Um, so so coming back historically now, you know, re, re, so we, we have the Last Supper, Good Friday, the desolation on Holy Saturday. Then we have this curious encounter of the two apostles on the road to Emmaus and several other encounters of people who experience Christ as still present, but with them in a different form. We've talked about that a lot on the gathering as the meaning of the, of the resurrection. And the resurrection is the central reason there is a Christian church, that they experienced the one they loved as still present and alive. And then the main reading there from Luke, they knew him in the breaking of the bread. So, and then you see him say to Mary Magdalene, do not cling to me. And as Pope Benedict goes on later to explain, the early church understood that phrase, do not cling to me, meaning you can still hold on to me as your Lord and the one who is present to you, the one who, who became man so that you could become God. You can still hold on to me, but you can't hold on to me in the same way that you used to hold on to me as your rabbi. Remember, she says to him, Rabboni, and he says, do not cling to me. And Benedict says, wrapped up in that phrase is Jesus' implication to her, do cling to me no longer as your teacher, cling to me no longer as your rabbi, cling to me now as the mystery the mystery of the one who is present as the one who overcomes death. And you will know me as that Lord and Master in the breaking of the bread. So the central mystery of the Christian church was to gather for the breaking of the bread where he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Okay, so the, the church in the beginning, now later they also remembered that he, he had commanded them to baptize. So the people who gathered, and then we know from the Acts of the Apostles, this is just averting a little bit to, um, to, to uh, Shannon's question about confirmation. We know, from, we know from the early church and we know from the Acts of the Apostles that when people were baptized, they also they had an additional a falling of the Holy Spirit upon people. In other words, there was a confirmation of their baptism by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It was like a second baptism. You see it in several episodes from, from Acts where Philip goes down and says, have you been baptized by the Holy Spirit? No, we were only baptized by water. What's this baptism of the Holy Spirit? And the Holy Spirit fell upon them. That was the sacrament of confirmation. So so the coming of the Holy Spirit upon people who are baptized either at the moment they're baptized or at some subsequent point is the scriptural lineaments of, of the sacrament of confirmation. But we also know from the early church that the way that a person was initiated into, see the church, it was called the church, but it was mostly called those who enter the mysteries. Mm -hmm. So the, the church was those who assembled to celebrate the mysteries. The, the, the only purpose for the church is to gather in the name of the Lord, to, to know him in the breaking of the bread and in his word. Now from that, confirmation was always a part of that, and praying for the dead was always a part of that, and confessing your sins was always a part of that. Mm -hmm. And and I mean, all these things are known historically and how they developed. Um, I've handed out here before um, a, a fourth century rite of passage, that little article, and it's a 
recon some fictional reconstruction of the earliest documents of the Christian church around how people were initiated into the Christian church and they were they were given a two or three year uh, period of, of screening or vetting. And then once they were admitted to the mysteries, they were brought into the assembly on the Easter vigil and they were uh, immersed in the water naked completely brought up and then completely covered with oil as a sign of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And then they were Eucharisticized. So they received all those sacraments in that order in the early church, baptism, confirmation, or what they called the anoint, the, they called it chrismation or Christification. They were being, because the Christ means anointed and anointed. And, and so, so, so Christians, the word Christian used for that, those people who gathered to celebrate the mysteries, that word Christian was first used, we learned from the books of, of the Acts of the Apostle, was first used in Antioch to describe the anointed ones. They are the ones who are anointed. What are they anointed with? They are anointed with the Holy Spirit. When does the anointing with the Holy Spirit happen? It happens when they gather to celebrate the Eucharist. Okay, so all of those things were, were seen as parts of a whole. And the whole was that the risen Lord makes himself known in the breaking of the bread and pours out his Holy Spirit to chrismate or Christify or Eucharisticize those who partake of these divine mysteries. Everything was one mystery of God and man becoming one through the power of the risen Christ communicated and made possible through these efficacious symbols known as the sacraments. Efficacious means they accomplish what they signify. So they signify a one flesh union with us because we eat bread and drink wine. That becomes part of our flesh. It becomes part of us and we become part of it. And that's what St. Augustine would later say, when I eat your body and drink your blood, I don't make you just part of me. You make me part of you. I don't take you into me. You take me into you. So there's a communion here. Okay, so the, the, the fontal mystery, the central mystery of the Christian faith is holy communion. Commu not just, it's sacramentally enacted, but it's spiritually effected. Okay, so it's sacramentally enacted, but spiritually affected. So when I kiss someone, I'm sacramentally expressing, but at the same time, I'm deepening the connection. The connection, the connection is deepened when the external manifestation is enacted. Now, here's an important point. I'll just make a parenthesis here just about sacramental theology, because I want to get on a little further to how this is all grounded in the Trinity, which is the only real place to understand any of this. Um, but that is this, an external sign communicates and deepens that which it expresses. An external symbol, whether it's the Eucharist or the sacrament of reconciliation or a kiss or the act of intercourse in marriage. See, if I, if I, if I, well, I'll, I'll speak about premarital sex here in just a minute, okay, because I want to talk about that. Um, but, I, but, I, but, but the sexual act in the sacrament of marriage is the sacramental expression of the invisible reality. So the consummation, the sacrament is its consummation, okay? And so I go back to communion in marriage when I exchange physical intimacy with my spouse, or it could also be an intimacy of words because those are physical expressions. It can be any expression of love, but most quintessentially in the actual marital act or the nuptial act. And what I wanna to get to eventually in this gathering as, and as I do it in every course I teach and, and because this is John Paul's vision and it's, it's a Trinitarian vision, but ultimately, the whole of the Christian mystery is a nuptial act of intercourse with God. And it is a one flesh union act of intercourse with God. That's why we have the Eucharist. But to back up for just a minute here, coming back to the marital act and the, and, and the or any expression 
uh, let, let's take a less sexual thing, though the, the sexual one expresses it the best and the most powerfully. And, and, and I'll stick with that for a minute, but I want I want to use a, a lesser example as well. Let me let me I'll go back and use a lesser example. Forgive me all my back and forth here. You remember in the garden, Judas comes up and how does he betray Jesus? He betrays him with a kiss. Now a kiss, is an outward expression of interior bondedness. But notice in the case of Judas, the exterior action communicates just the opposite. And instead, and when that is the case, when there's something about the invisible dimension of the external expression, that is out of alignment with or the opposite of what the external symbol is manifesting, not only does it not deepen the union, Every action that we do is sacramental, especially every action of affection that we express is sacramental. If, however, and when I express, when, it, when, it, when a symbol expresses an in, invisible reality that is perfectly in alignment with the invisible reality, when the kiss really expresses love, see, symbols are also symbolically appropriate to what they express. Now I'm starting to sound like a scholastic theologian, okay? <laughs> and, I, and I despise them, so I don't despise them, but I find that it's very difficult for people to gather the mystical meaning from them. So, but, but it's important to say, so, so a kiss, so let me put it this way, a kiss expresses one level of affection. A hug expresses, a handshake expresses one level of affection. A wave expresses one level of affection. A handshake expresses another level of affection. A hug expresses another level of expression. A kiss expresses another level of affection. There are many levels to kisses as well, which I won't go into. <laughs> and then finally, Intercourse connotes a kind of complete surrender, okay? Now, if the internal disposition of the person expressing those things does not align perfectly with the form of the external expression, well, I'll say it more positively. If it does, it deepens the connection. If it doesn't, it damages and can in fact destroy the connection. Now, nothing can ever destroy our connection with God, but it can destroy our ability to experience our connection with God. Okay, so all that's important background. So when Judas comes and betrays Jesus with a kiss, the invisible portion on Judas's part, not on Jesus' part, but on Judas's part, well, I'm, I'm going to make another mystical statement here that I've not read by anybody else, but I'm going to hold to it myself till the day I die. The kiss that Judas did is what constellated or activated the guilt and shame within Judas that motivated him later to kill himself. Whenever there is a hiatus or a discrepancy between what I'm saying and what I'm feeling, whenever I don't live in the truth, whenever my actions do not align with my gestures. Whenever there's a lack of integrity between what I'm saying and what I'm doing, especially when I'm touching or looking or expressing myself, when I lack that integrity, when I lie, when I, when I, when my inner, when my inner intentionality does not align with my exterior manifestation of what I'm trying to tell you, that is a sacramental action that has a deleterious effect. But whenever any of my actions align perfectly with how my heart is, the relationship is deepened. And in the case of Judas and Jesus, the kiss that Judas gave betrayed Judas, not Jesus. 
Yeah. Okay, it hurt, it damaged. And what I want to say, I've not read this anywhere else, but I'll put it in the next book I write. I think the kiss, though, did have the sacramental effect on Jesus in his humanity, that it increased his love for Judas. Okay, and you're not able to get there mystically if you continue to imagine God as just a larger version of an angry parent. Okay, so all that being said, now, that's the kiss with Judas. Now let me come to premarital sex. Okay, Premar premarital sex is always a lie. Because the action says, I am fully surrendered to you, but the in, but there's when there's a holding back, this is why the church invades also against contraception. When there, whenever there's a holding back in the heart, sexuality then becomes weaponized in the relationship and it becomes an instrument of destruction rather than holy communion. Okay, and sexuality is. God's greatest sacrament of holy communion. And so the Eucharistic communion that we celebrate is just an external image of a larger sacramental reality that we experience, not just in the sacrament of the Eucharist, but in the incarnation itself. Because when God became man, humanity and God became one, and humanity became divinized. God became man so that man can become God. So there's a nuptial mystery that takes place when Jesus is consumed, consumed. <laughs> yes, the nuptial mystery takes place when Jesus is consumed in the Eucharist. We are having an, a, an act of spiritual intercourse. I often point out in St. Andrew's church here that I celebrate Eucharist on Sunday with, or the one I'm going to take Father Mark down soon to the to the Basilica, and you're going to notice the main altar there. And if you go to Europe, you'll see all the main altars for the most part, like St. Peter's Basilica is covered with an enormous, they call it a baldacchino, a canopy. It's usually four pillars. And if you look closely, it'll remind you of a canopy bed. And that's exactly what it is meant to remind wow. you of. Because the Eucharist is the marriage feast of the Lamb. Oh my! Say that again. The Eucharist. I said this in the cursio. <laughs> you weren't. You, you weren't listening <laughs> the first <laughs> time around. <laughs> all all Eucharistic communities who know what the Eucharistic mystery is have a well. I mean, they have a canopy. You know, the Jews and of course they the Jews when they celebrate a wedding always have the canopy. And why do they do that? And Jews wear a little yarmulke on their head. Why do they are wearing a, a head canopy? Why do they do that? Now they don't do it for the same reason we do it, but we do it for a reason that is the perfection of the reason why they do it for, or the fullness of the reason that they do it for. Jews wear a yarmulke and they celebrate weddings under the canopy because the cloud that came down and enveloped the tent of meeting where Moses would enter to communicate or commune or have intercourse with God. See, intercourse can mean an exchange, right? And, and so human intercourse is the bodies are the means of a divine exchange between persons in marriage. That makes it a sacrament. That makes it a sacrament. It, it, it's a sacrament before it happens in marriage. Any, any, the body is a sacramental instrument of spiritual expression. Okay, so when I smile at you, I, I'm using my body to touch you with something that I have for you. Mm -hmm. And God is using all of our bodies to touch each other with that which he has for us. Yeah. Okay. Now, can you repeat that? And, okay, coming, coming back to the canopy, though. So with the Jews, it was an expression of the Shekinah, Shekinah or Shekinah. 
the, the, the glory of God, the presence of God, God's presence in the Old Testament. This is so powerful. The word for glory in, in Hebrew is kabod, and it has, a, it, it has a kind of heaviness about it. It has a weight. We talk about St. Paul taught in the second letter to the Corinthians talked about the weight of glory. God's glory was a cloying. It was, a, it was like drinking of God's glory was like drinking molasses or drinking very rich honey. It was very thick. The cloud, you remember the cloud that would come and envelop the mountain when Moses went up to get the Ten Commandments. He was lost in the cloud. The cloud would descend on Mount Horeb and on Mount Sinai, and you would hear the peals of thunder. That's where most people, Charlton Heston, Moses, Moses, take off thine shoes from off thine feet. Everybody's picture of Moses is Charleston Heston, and everybody's picture of God is the lightning from the cloud, you know? But it's true that there, so, so what the cloud connoted was that somehow the creator of the universe who transcends everything is, and is beyond everything that he has created has not become visible, but has manifested his presence in this heavy cloud that came down. And it was a thick darkness. So kabod and the heaviness of glory. Me, you know, when, when, when kings would come out in the Middle Ages, you know, and to this day, people like Archbishop Burke will still come out uh, like, <laughs> like this. Uh, they will be heavy clad in layer after layer of now, now, that's a beautiful thing in its own way, because what it's trying to connote is that the glory of God weighs on people. It comes down, but in the Old Testament, it still had a great deal of foreboding about it, okay? And that's why we call the New Testament new. The New Testament is a revelation that the heaviness of God has been, has been transformed into the lightness of Christ. That's why he was able to rise from the dead. <laughs> Not exactly true, but, uh, but, 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 the, but the, it's, it's very important to, to understand Christ, the transfiguration, the baptism in the Jordan, the luminous mysteries. Very important to contemplate that cloud of God's presence in the Old Testament. And so when Moses, and this is the one that I avert to so much to try to make the link between us and the cloud of the Old Testament and the presence of Christ in the Eucharist under the canopy, and that is this. When Moses went into the meeting tent that the cloud had enveloped, when he came out, you remember, I tell you this all the time, his face was radiant with the glory of God. And it was so brilliant, what, that he had to put a veil over his face to keep other people from being disintegrated by the glory of God. And when people would approach the mountain when the cloud was upon it, if they got too close, they would be annihilated, kind of like a bug going towards a, towards yeah. a zapper. <laughs> okay, and, and that's exactly what it was. The, the presence of God was a divinizing, an electrifying presence. Okay, that's what the image of the lightning and the thunder is. It's the Old Testament is straining in its own symbolic way to express that the presence of God is so electrifying that unless you were given a special gift by God, like Moses and Aaron were, you were not capacitated to enter the presence of God because it would annihilate you. The presence of God was so powerful that it would, no finite, no created, no limited human being or any other being could enter the presence of God and live. No one can look on the face of God, it says repeatedly in the Old Testament, especially the book of Exodus and Deuteronomy, no one can look on the face of God and live, except many times it says Moses would speak to God face to face. Okay, now in that you can see, I mean, I could do a whole another hour and a half here on the relation of the two Testaments, because there you can begin to see how the New Testament is speaking its face out a little bit, because there is one person who by the grace of God was capacitated. It, it was made possible for Moses and Aaron to look at the face of God and not only not just live, but to radiate 
the electrical presence of God that was present in the cloud of God's presence. So Moses came out transfigured by God's glory. Okay, not entirely like Christ was on Tabor, but his face was glowing with the glory of God. And that was a little premonition of what, of what is to come. So Jews to this day wear the yarmulke and celebrate their festivities under the canopy because the canopy represents the benevolence, benevolent, overarching, all protective presence of God that they are no longer, uh, because it's not the actual cloud, but it's a symbol of the cloud, they are able to, to, to walk under it and be under it without annihilation. Okay, is that making sense to you? Yeah. So, so then if you, if, you, if you then move from that to our Eucharistic meeting tent, so what the church then is, is the new meeting tent of God. But instead of just Moses and the priests being able to enter, we are all, by virtue of our baptism, capacitated to enter the presence of God and to be divinized with the divinity of God that is made sacramentally, is sacramentally communicated to us, first in the humanity of Christ and then in the sacraments that he has bequeathed to us as extensions of his own human nature. Is that making sense? Okay. <laughs> right. Uh, what did I say? Um, Right. So, so the, the, the presence, so the presence of God that we saw in the cloud that was annihilating to people. Yeah, this is the link I'm looking for. Thank you for that. Um, the presence of God in the Old Testament that was, that, that, that was, that was destructive to the people, also protective of the people, but also destructive of the people. So there you have, that's why the Old Testament developed that ambiguous relationship with God they felt protected by him, so they felt loved by him, but they were also afraid of him, because if you got too close, you could die. Now, Moses didn't. Moses was Moses and Aaron and others were had certain exemptions, okay? Um, but as we move into the, into the New Testament, we see that that same presence of God now, now no, let, let one other piece in here to understand the radical mystery and importance and newness of, of the incarnation. And that is this. When the Jews came out, out, of the, out of the desert and were given the promised land, the cloud disappeared. But they took the Ark of the Covenant and the bread that had sustained them in the desert and they, play, and they built another tent around it. They built a, per see, they had the tent of meeting when they were moving from place to place in the desert for 40 years. But when they finally were established in their own land and God had made good on his promises to Moses, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I will give you your, your uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I will give you the land of your fathers, the, prom the land of the promise. When they're established, they build a permanent meeting tent called the temple. Solomon builds this huge temple. Mm -hmm. And now that becomes the place of God's presence. And in the temple, they kept the ark. Well, actually, the ark was eventually taken from the temple. But they always looked at the temple as the place of God's presence. And then within the temple, they had an inner room called the Holy of Holies, where again, because they wanted to keep alive this sense of God's unapproachable presence, but his protective presence at the same time. See, the Jews... But... The one who gave us all these is somehow present in this temple like he was present in the tent of meeting. 
and only the high priest once a year can enter the Holy of Holies and endure the presence of God. And when he would come out, guess what he would come out with? He'd come out looking like Archbishop Burke. He would be, he would be clothed in all a big crown, all these garments, and he would come out and he would come out and, and for one day, he would bestow at one month on the people. He would bestow, they had another ritual that they associated with it, but they would have a, a cleansing of their sins, and then they would receive a share in the glory of God for one day. Okay, and they would repeat that, and, they, and then they would, and, but, but after the day of atonement, then they would go back to sinning. And then they would go back to offering sacrifice and atonement for their sins. But the atonement would finally be really affected once a day when the high priest went into the Holy Holies. And I'm not, I'm not accurate, perfectly accurate here with all the details of these rituals, but you can see what they were trying to do. So they still believe that God was somewhat approachable, but it was still restricted to a very priestly class and then even in that class to one person and that one person was allowed only one day and and the effect of his going in there for one day was at one month or atonement with the whole people of Israel for one day and the following day they're back to the same old same old okay and and so this was the practice of Israelite religion a sacrificial religion and I could talk forever about why they had bloody sacrifices and what they were hoping to achieve and how that has developed over the centuries in all of human history and especially in Israel. Animal sacrifice was an improvement upon human sacrifice and all of the sacrifice was an attempt to ameliorate the gods to some extent and to ritually present violence that would have consumed the nation if the sacrifices had not been offered but that's another talk for another time. Okay, into this mix comes the true temple of God's presence, who is the son of Mary. And this is what to this day becomes, continues to be so bewildering, even to priests and nuns and people that I talk to, they, they, and for Father Mark, welcome Father Mark to our gathering. I'll introduce you to everybody as soon as we're finished here. Um, for Father Mark's sake, I'm going to just say very briefly that so much of the understanding of what we call the New Testament, most Christians don't know why it's new because they continue to view God in large part just like the Jews viewed God as part mercy, part part justice, and you can never tell which side of the bed he's going to wake up on in the morning. <laughs> and if that's your view of God, there's nothing new under the sun because the old the New Testament then is just a larger version of the Old Testament. So what's utterly new about the new? Well, my view is that in the Western Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, the Latin Rite, which separated from the East in the 11th century, but always had a mindset somewhat different from the East, even in the earliest days, it has lost in large part, and this is not just me saying this, this is all the popes from John the 23rd through the present, plus many scholars and, and, and students of the early church prior to the Second Vatican Council, who rediscovered a Christian vision of the incarnation and of the liturgy and of the church as a Eucharistic assembly, putting people into intimate communion with God, um, rediscovered this and realized we, in our, in our Western moralized, dogmatized, rigidified, scler scleroticized, to use a word of Pope Benedict XVI, in our scler scler sclerotic Christianity and the hardening of the arteries, the blood flow of the Christian mystery has virtually dried up. So we have to rediscover a new version of the New Testament. We have to discover, and, 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 and it turns out that the new version is the more ancient version. And it's a version that is still very, very has never been lost and has always been radiant in the Christian art and the Christian liturgy and the Christian practice of the Christians in the Eastern part of the church in, in Ukraine, in, in Greece, in, in Syria, 
in Iran, Iraq, in uh, the, the Chaldean Christians, the Coptic Christians down in Egypt, uh, the Greek Christians in Greece, um, the Romanian Christians, the Orthodox Christians who are in communion with the Catholic Church, uh, the Russian Christians, the, the, even the Indian Christians. The, 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 so there have been Christian, the, Christ, the understanding of the Christian mystery, we have a different view of it. We've developed over many centuries a, a different and, and, and just, just more moralistic and, and more um, ritualistic version of the Christian mystery than is prevalent in the Christian East. Well, Vatican II Council was meant to be a renewal of an earlier vision of the Christian mystery. And Pope John Paul II wrote about it at great length in his Theology of the Body. Uh, Pope Benedict spent his entire life trying to convey this vision to the Latin church. And, and of course, my mission on these Wednesday gatherings is to do the same. And what's the heart of the, what's the heart of the difference? And the heart of the difference is, uh, and the line from Saint Athanasius, who was an early church father. Um, and anything that I say on these talks is always drawn from my understanding of the early church fathers, and they they have such an in depth. Uh, father Mark and I are good friends with a, another priest from the Congo named Father Emmanuel. He did his PhD dissertation on the Eucharistic theology of Justin Martyr, who was an early Christian father, and uh, wrote beautifully on the Eucharist in a way that would almost make no sense to a Latin Catholic because it has such a different view of the Eucharist. It's all the same sacrament, but how it's understood is understood much more profoundly, and it's understood to, to put it simply, the Eucharist is understood in a more personalized and a more nuptialized way in the Christian East, and hence the reason for the Baldacchinos. Because in the Christian East, the whole of Christianity is looked at as a nuptial mystery between God and humanity. In other words, God did not come into the world. This notion that we have in the Latin West, that Christ came to make atonement for our sins, is not interpreted. It's, it's not, everybody knows from the beginning of Christianity that di Christ died for our sins. Everybody knows that. But how that phrase has been understood, it, it was not understood as making a payment of a debt until about 11 centuries into the church's understanding of itself. And only then in the Christian West through the writings of St. Anselm and some other people. Prior to that, the at-one-ment or the atonement was looked at not as the repayment of a debt. Christ, Christ did not come into the world as a response to the sinfulness of humanity. He came into the world because humanity had been created by the Father ad, as his bride. Mm, say it again. Christ did not come into the world for the early church fathers to, 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 to save. Everybody admits that he saved us from our sins, but it's a byproduct of his, of his marrying us. <laughs> when he married us, we became cleansed by virtue of our union with him. Okay, so for the early church, Christ did not come into the world to cancel a debt or to restore a broken union between humanity. In other words, human sin, the original sin, was not the occasion for God drawing up the incarnation and saying, I know how I can make things right. I'll send my son to pay the penalty for what the world owes him. Everybody's familiar with that theory. We were all taught it in grade school. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's. A, but it's, a, but it's a theory of why Christ came into the world that's only unique to the Western Church, Catholic and Protestant. Protestants have taken it way beyond a level of gruesomeness that we ever <laughs> thought to take it in the Catholic Church, and I could talk to you all day about that as well. But put all that aside for a minute. The main Christ did not come into the world because of anything we did or didn't do, from an early church perspective. 
Christ came into the world because, as St. Paul would later say, and everything I'm saying here is really coming straight out of the vision of St. Paul, Christ came into the world because we are God's gift to him. You remember in his prayer in John 17, he says, Father, they are your gift to me. And later Paul would say, he is the, John, John himself said, how can the bridegroom be how can the 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 the, 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 the herald of the bride? What, what is it? John says, uh, "I am not the the when the bridegroom comes, the best man has to step aside. I am not the Christ. The one coming after me is greater than me. When the bridegroom, oh, Jesus Himself says, as long as the bridegroom is here, the wedding guests cannot fast. So Christ views the humanity as His bride." chosen for him by his father from before the foundation of the world. This is why St. Paul could amplify this theme so beautifully. He, he says for each one of us, before you, well, Isaiah hinted at this when he said, before you were conceived in your mother's womb, I knew you. And Paul extends that vision by saying, before the foundation of the world, you were chosen by God to be holy and blameless in his sight, the unblemished bride of the unblemished lamb. Okay, so for the early church, Christianity is, and we had this today, I alluded to this, even though I got up late for mass and didn't prepare a homily, it came, to, it always comes to me when I read this parable. Today we had the parable that doesn't sound nuptial at all. But once you begin to look at Christ as the bridegroom, and if you look at Christ as affecting a, a nuptial act of union, one flesh union with his bride, which is not just the church, his bride is the whole world. The church, the church is the sacramental means that he uses to espouse himself not, e not only, not even only to uh, humanity, but to the entire cosmos. St. Paul has this notion of, of, of all things being brought together in union with Christ. So it's humanity, but I, I don't want to go too much into that now because I'm getting confused in my own mind. Um, <laughs> let's come back to the fact that humanity and the church in particular, it, let, uh, uh, since I'm on this track, just as Israel was meant to be a sacramental community that God was using to, to sacramentalize or to sanctify the entire world and bring the entire world back in to its original nuptial relationship with God. Remember in the garden, God and Adam and Eve walked together as a couple. They were one. It wasn't that the marital theme is not so prevalent in Genesis, except with Adam and Eve, who are even in the garden, they are a sacramental expression of God with humanity, God being figured in Adam, humanity being figured in Eve. Okay, let us make man in our image and likeness, male and female, he made them. The complementarity of the sexes is an image both of the persons of the Trinity, Father and Son. Within the Trinity, the Son is the receiver of the Father. Okay, so in the so 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 the Son, in a certain sense, the Son is the feminine dimension of the mystery of God, and the Father is the progenitor. So we talk about the Father as the one who generates the, the Father is the ungenerated mystery who generates the Son, who, who then both send the Holy Spirit, enabling us to be drawn up into their nuptial mystery of giver and receiver. Yes. You think I should ring the bell the on picture, that? picture, yes. Okay. So you're getting the picture here, okay, that there is a, there is a movement Boy, I'm really I'm all I'm not all tangled up here, but I got a lot I got a lot of dishes that I'm spinning here. You know those guys who spin those dishes, and 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 I suppose this is this is important because I, I want you to see that all the spinning plates I have here, us being entering a, a nuptial union with the with the with the bridegroom under the canopy at mass. 
the altar being the nuptial bed where Christ consummates in a one flesh union, his marital union with us in the Eucharist. The Eucharist is an act of intercourse between the seed of the Father, who is Jesus, with the bride, who is us, coming to Holy Communion. We are corporately the bride of Christ. He inseminates us with the seed. When he hands you the host, that's the equivalent of the seed in an act of human intercourse being deposited into the womb of the woman. Who's the woman? The, the assembly that is there to receive the word of God. So the word of God and the seed of God are synonymous. When Jesus says today in the gospel, I cast the seed, some falls on rocky soil. He's speaking primarily of himself. It's real. He says the son is the, is the sower and the, so, and, the, and the seed is the word of God. But if you take that up a level, you can see that the father is the sower and the son is the seed. And he enters those who will receive him. And Mary was the first to receive him when she said, let it be done to me according to your word. And there was a divine, she had God as her, Jesus had God as his father, Mary as his bride. So you have this act of human divine intercourse in the incarnation where the son of God is conceived. And that's the single same mystery that we are celebrating sacramentally in the Eucharist. And this is the single same mystery that is celebrating it, celebrated in the same way in different dimensions in the other six sacraments. Isn't that what Moses had in his relationship? Did Moses have that? Moses, Moses did have that, but not in the same way that we have that. Okay, so Moses had the equivalent of, of a, you remember when Jesus, uh, Veronica put the veil on Jesus' face and there was an imprint. Mm -hmm. Moses had the equivalent of a hug with God. Okay. 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 We have the equivalent of a nuptial embrace with God. Okay. And John Paul repeatedly said, if you can get the concupiscence out of your mind long enough to imagine the, the penetration, the, the union, the one flesh union of man and woman, as the embrace of God with the human person. And in fact, many mystics who have experienced their, their interior union with God have experienced sexual ecstasy. Oh, really? Sure, if you read the writings, yeah. John of the, it's in John of the Cross, it's in Teresa of Avila. I know other people who have prayed in this way and said, they've come to confession to me. And they've said, I feel guilty. I had an orgasm and all I was doing was praying. And I said, that is the greatest gift from God. St. John of the Cross, I, I used to, I, I, I have it noted up somewhere in my notes because I've taught John of the Cross for many years. There is a place where he says that after Holy Communion, you will often sometimes feel, he doesn't exactly, I think he even says sexual stimulation. He's, and, he, and he explains it by saying that when God touches the deepest center of the soul, it reverberates through the body. It works from the inside out and it manifests itself sometimes in a certain tingling of the senses and sometimes an arousal. It is a gift. And that's what the Song of Songs is, is ex trying to express that if we, could, if we could actually have an experiential sense of what's, what's transpiring in the Eucharist, we would die of joy. We, we, we would, and, and so I say to people, the, 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 the union, people want to say, what is heaven like? And I say, well, I'll just put it this way. The, the ecstasy of the sexual union is, is the dimmest intimation of what you will feel when you're in heaven. And you won't need a blue pill. <laughs> it will be it will be sustainable, as the millennials like to say. When we've been there ten thousand days, it'll be as if we've just begun. Really for the men. This is hope. This is this is hope for many people. Okay, so so it's a um, so it truly is. But but you see, all the sacraments. It's important to see that the sacram the sacraments are rooted in the Eucharist, 
And the Eucharist is rooted in Christ, and Christ is rooted in the Trinity. Because the epicenter of the ecstasy, the epicenter of the ecstasy is found only in the mystery of God. God and the, and so when Jesus is speaking in the gospel, everybody takes his words as if he's trying to give us advice. He's not really trying to give us advice. And it takes a while to adjust your way of approaching the scriptures in this way. But if you like the Sermon on the Mount, I often use this to illustrate this approach. When Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, they shall, they shall inherit the kingdom of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are those of pure of heart, they will see God. Most people are thinking, oh, he's telling me to be a pure of heart. Well, he is doing that, yes. But he's not, he is doing that, but it's only at at least the third level of meaning. The first, le everything Jesus says is primarily, and it takes a while to learn how to, to re-look at scripture this way. Almost everything that Jesus says, the primary meaning refers to something about himself or something about his relationship with his father. So when he says, blessed are the pure in heart, he's talking about himself. I am, and blessed this, blessed, blessed there means blissful. That's how it should be translated. Ecstatic are those who are pure of heart. So if I'm Jesus saying that, here's how he's thinking to himself. I am blissful because my father has granted me a pure heart to behold his glory. See, everything about Jesus always comes back to that phrase in Paul. Though he was in the form of God, Jesus did not deem equality with God. You have to remember that, and, and, and you, I got to be careful here because there is a heresy in the early church called subordinationism represented by the heretic Arius, where he said Jesus is less than God. He's divine, but he's less than God. He's higher than the angels, but less than God. That's not true. He is God, God of God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial. That word consubstantial came from St. Athanasius, homoousion in Greek. It means to be of the... He's of the, same, of the same substance, but of course that begs the question, what does substance mean, okay? And substance means that of a certain kind, okay? And so the old, Jesus is the same kind of thing as the Father, but experiences himself as the one to whom, he experiences the Father as the one to whom he owes everything. Okay, so within the interiority of the second person of the Trinity is a certain gratitude or thankfulness for having been begotten. Mm -hmm. Now, we've reached the turning point of the session. Because the second person of the Trinity is begotten of the Father, and therefore is God of God, true God of true God, begotten, not made, but the Father is the unbegotten source of the one who is begotten. Mm -hmm. That does not imply, as Athanasius said, that the Father preceded the Son. It does sound like it, and that's where Arius and, and many Protestant Catholics in particular go off the rails in trying to understand Jesus, and we're, we're going to put that whole patristic discussion aside for a moment. I'm just trying to show you that the early church father said the father is the unbegotten one, the son is the one who is begotten, and the spirit is the one who proceeds from the begotten and the unbegotten. Okay, And as the begotten Son of God, though equal in dignity and co-eternal with the Father, 
as the begotten one, he experiences himself as the one who has all that he is from the one who is greater than he. <laughs> That's why you have that ambivalence in John's gospel. Jesus says, the father is greater than I, but the father and I are one. That's pointing to that same perichoretic mystery within the life of the Trinity. But here's my point. Within the life of the Trinity itself, Jesus experiences himself as the one who needs, even though as God, he doesn't need anything, but he experiences himself as the one who needs to give thanks to the Father for having begotten him. Does that make sense? Kind of? Kind of. That should make more than kind of sense. But, I have to okay. process that for okay. a while. You're moving on to the next topic. Yeah, it's why we call it the second person of the Trinity, not in time and not in dignity. It means that Jesus is other from the Father, and in his otherness, he experiences himself as the one who needs to be grateful to the one who begat, begot him. Okay. And another word for being thankful for my very being as God, another word for being grateful for being the only begotten Son of God is in Greek, Eucharistia, hmm. Eucharist. So within the life of the Trinity, Christ is the Eucharist, the Eucharist, the Eucharistic one, grateful. the one who is grateful. Okay. And then he sees through this Holy Spirit that the Father has created a body humanity as the Father's gift to the Son. And he has made that body of humanity the bride of this son. So the father sends the son to be one with his bride. Why? So that the bride can receive through the seed of the father, who is the son, the life of the one who made the bride for the son. Okay? So Christ comes to join us. The Christ comes really, and Pope Benedict wrote so beautifully about this. Christ comes, if, you, if, you, if you've had too much of the, of the bridal and marital metaphor here, think of it this way. Christ comes to draw us up into his relationship of giving and receiving that he has enjoyed from all eternity with his father through the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so there was no, the, the son and the father were completely ecstatically intercoursally related to each other in the mystery of the Trinity from all eternity. They didn't need the world. They didn't need humanity. And, and I'll, now I'll come back. We have a couple of minutes here. I'll come back just for Father Mark's sake to another quote from that you've heard me say here many times. He may never have heard this. It certainly was a, it was a revolutionary idea to me and a shock, not a shock to me, but it awakened me to the, to the, to the, to the utter astounding good news of the New Testament. It was from St. Irenaeus. So the first first line that awakened me was God became man so man could become God so that we could be drawn up into the life of God and become so one with God that the angels themselves could no longer tell any difference like the three young men in the fiery furnace with the fourth person walking around with them. The early church fathers always pointed to that as an image of God becoming man so man could become human. We are drawn up into the furnace of the Trinitarian love and we are glorified with the same glory that they have. We become incandescent with the same 
heat of love that radiates among those three in the furnace of God's mystery, and we walk around with them like a fourth member of their triune life, just as indestructible and just as glorious as they are. And when you look in from the outside, like the angels do, they can't tell any difference between humanity and divinity. They don't know who's who. It's all one, even though they're still distinctness and otherness evident in the mystery, okay? That's that's the purpose of the incarnation. So God became man, so man could become God. Not, not like God, but so one with God that, that well, as St. Maximus the Confessor says, we become God in Christ in the same measure that Christ became human in Mary. I mean, just contemplate that for a while. God, be, We become God in the same measure and in the same manner that Christ became man in the person of Mary. Okay, so, so when, when the eternal word was conceived in the womb of Mary and clothed himself with humanity, he was like us in every way. He, had, he acquired or assumed a human nature, even though he remained a divine person. He remained who he was in the Trinity, but became what we are as a human being. When we are reconceived in the womb of God through the incarnation, we remain who we are, but we become what he is, and we clothe ourselves with divinity in the same manner that he clothed himself with humanity. And so we acquire, to put it simply, we acquire all the characteristics of what it means to be God, even though we remain human. Okay, we, we remain human persons with a divine nature, just as Jesus remained a divine person with a human nature. And you've heard me say that hundreds, if not thousands of times in these gatherings. But here's a thought that takes that a, 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 a step further, because I said a minute ago, so the incarnation then is the assimilation or the assumption, the lifting up of earth into heaven, heaven comes down to earth in the person of Christ in order to unite all of the earth with itself and incorporate it into the life of heaven. And that actually happened, according to the early church fathers, the whole of what I just said there, the whole of the cosmos, the whole of humanity was incorporated mystically into the life of the Trinity the moment Mary said, let it be done to me, accord. There was a, there's an infinitesimal point where the whole of created reality is now gathered into the divinity of the triune life of God. And it's being perfected even at this moment in a way that we have yet to be, that, that, that has yet to be fully manifest or made visible. But it's only a matter of time. Okay. Wow. Okay. Now, the quote that I was going to add on to this from St. Irenaeus is this one, that since he who, since he who, I'm trying to think, of, well, what Irenaeus really said was, since, since he who saves always existed, Jesus, in the Trinity, since he who saves always existed, Oh, I was saying a minute ago that, that God in his ecstatic love was perfectly happy and needed nothing prior to the creation of everything, okay? And then I started to say, and that's what reminded me of Irenaeus, then I started to say, so then people ask, well, if God was completely happy and Jesus was this Eucharistic second person of divine gratitude within the life of the Father and the Spirit. Why did they need to create anything at all? Right. That question gets asked. And there's, of course, no one knows the mind of God. But St. Irenaeus said this to explain why God then created, made creation, and even further, why God made creation to be the, and humanity in particular, but I'm including the whole of creation here. 
because creation was made for humanity. Okay, so first the world was created and then humanity was placed in it because the world was meant to be a sac. The world is a gift to humanity, just like humanity is a gift from the father to the son. Does that make sense? Okay, good. So the world was created as a gift to humanity and humanity was created as a gift to the son. But why, so we beg, so beg, but it begs the question, why did the father feel it necessary to create humanity at all if he and the son were perfectly happy prior to that? It's nice to know that we're a gift for the son, but, it, but if it didn't need to be, how much could it mean to him? It would be one way of asking the question. I would never ask it that way, but it could be asked that way. And here's what St. Irenaeus said. Now I'm gonna tell you what he said originally, then I'm gonna to try to reconfigure it to explain why God created something when he was in need of nothing. And that is this. So first thing that St. Irenaeus said was looking, so God's kind of beholding his son in the Trinity from all eternity. And Irenaeus said this, because he who shows mercy, that's how he really said it. Since he who shows mercy or let's, for our purposes, let's, 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 say, let's just do that first. Since he who shows mercy always existed, so the divine mercy, right, Jesus, since he, so let's, let's put it this way, since he who was the divine mercy, maybe I'll put it in another key here, because <laughs> I've already told you that within the life of the Trinity, Jesus is already the Eucharist, right? He's already the thankful one. So let's say the father beholds the son and the son looks back at him with this persona of gratitude for having been begotten. And the father sees how thankful the son is to be the son. Mm -hmm. And he also sees how humble the son is not wanting to be the father. In other words, not wanting to compete with the one who begot him. See, because there's none of that. There's no sin in the Trinity, so there's no rivalry. There's no resentment. There's no no need for re there's no one-upsmanship. There's no envy. There's no nothing but right. but love. So when the Father who generate who be who begot the Son generated the Son out of His own fullness, sees how grateful the other is, and is content with being other. The father's heart is so touched by the son's gratitude. So I'll put it this way. Here's how Irenaeus actually says it. Okay. <laughs> since he who shows mercy always existed, the son, since he who shows mercy always existed, it was necessary that those who would need mercy, us, should be created so that the divine mercy would not exist in vain. <laughs> in other words, the father looks at the son and he says, oh my God, my son is filled with mercy. I think I'll need to create a world that needs to have his mercy so that his mercy won't be wasted just on me. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah. now let's change that to the Eucharist. Since he who shows grat who, since he who has infinite thanksgiving always existed, it was necessary that those who would need to learn to be thankful should be created so that he who knows best how to give thanks should not exist in vain. In other words, we were existed and he came to draw us up and out of our miserable, ungrateful lives contaminated by sin, which is just ingratitude, to draw us up into his own Eucharistic gratitude to his Father and give us a share of that eternal Eucharistic gratitude in the mystery that he bequeathed to us as his bride, namely the celebration of the Eucharist. Mm. That's actually very beautiful, whether you think so or not. <laughs> so, so that brings us almost right up to the hour. I think I'm going to kind of leave you with that. Can I try to simplify it in one minute? I should try to do that. The Trinity is a mystery 
of Eucharistic, intercoursal Eucharistic gratitude. The church is created to be a venue of mystical intercoursal gratitude with God in a one flesh union like unto a bride with a bridegroom. And is there one other? And we won't be happy <laughs> until we give ourselves over to the one who wants to really give ourselves. freely give ourselves over. And you see, yeah, I'll finish on this. St. Paul says, those who receive the mysteries, the bread and wine, unworthily receive to their own condemnation. Remember what I said that the sacramental expression of love in marriage becomes a weapon of destruction or of retaliation when the inner disposition of the participants do not align in love. And similarly, the practice of our religion actually distances us from God when we use our religion as an instrument of transaction or leverage against or with God. Our lives can, we can come to the Eucharist to have the Eucharist be fully beneficial and increase our holy communion with God that extends beyond the sacrament. The only way it can be efficacious for us, the only way it can deepen our communion with God is if we are fully, freely, and completely surrendered to God. And we say like the publican, um, Lord have mercy on me a sinner, not you, but me, not me, but you. Um, otherwise, um, it works, it has its opposite effect, but that's not a very happy note to finish on, but we'll finish there anyway. Let's finish with the glory be, and then we'll hang around. I want you all to meet Father Mark, and, um, and then we'll go from there. So glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Thank you all. So tomorrow you're using the reading from Song of Songs, right? I don't know, are we? It's Mary Magdalene. Oh, yeah, tomorrow is Mary Magdalene. <laughs> so true. It's an optional reading and most Yeah, I, I will, yeah. I love Mary Magdalene. I thought it was, uh, oh, that was Our Lady of Mount Carmel.